So if we can all come out and help support that. And uh, if you need, uh, if, you, if you would like to get in touch with Dean Henderson, if you can help with that, uh, I'm sure he would probably appreciate the help. Okay, so that's October the 29th. Instead of having worship service here, it'll be at Norval, and I'll find out what time the service will be uh, and uh, let you know next week. Okay. All right, and I don't think I have anything more. So, right, I'm going to let you carry on. <coughs> Thank you, Irene. Well, it's good to see you here today. God bless you for being here on this uh, lovely Sunday afternoon. Fall is in the air, uh, but uh, I want to hang out to summer as long as I can. How about you? Uh, next week, um, I guess it's the first Sunday in the fall. So, happy summer, Henry. As others perhaps may be coming in, we'll get started and we'll ask God to bless us and as we worship together and let's say it together. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs his eternal praise. He provided redemption for his people. Holy and awesome is his name. Amen. Let's stand together. All of our hymns this morning are from the Red Book. And we're seeing number 87, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. <laughs>
It certainly is now. And so, Father, this morning we bring before you our congregation. You know the situation and circumstances of all of us. And Lord, we know that some are, are very, very concerned about what's happening around them, and even with, with neighbors next door. And Lord, we pray that you'll give great grace and help us all to show the love of Jesus. May those who oppose us see the grace and the love in our eyes that only Jesus can shine through us. Lord, we pray for those who are in authority over us. We pray, Lord, that you'll give them wisdom and help them to know that they are accountable, not just to the people. They can fool the people some of the time, and many of the people all of the time, but no one is ever going to fool you. So help them to know that they are accountable to you. One day, we all must give an account of ourselves. Those who know you and love you, Lord, you'll, you'll, you'll reveal to us what you have laid up in store for us pleasures and joys eternally. And Lord, for others who will stand before you, having never given their hearts to you, who have never known you, who have been pretending or just plain rebellious, they will then hear those dreadful words, depart from me, I never knew you. Lord, we know that there are going to be tears streaming down your face when you say that. Because you will always and forever have a heart of love for the lost. Jesus said, I have come to seek and to save those who are lost. Each one of us, Lord, can remember the time in our lives when, when we were in darkness, living in darkness and in fear. We did not know you. We did not acknowledge you. We tried to do things our own way. But one day, Lord, you revealed to us that you have laid upon Jesus all of our sins, all of our iniquities. And by his stripes, as the prophet said, by his stripes, we are healed. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the peace and the joy and the assurance and the courage that that gives us knowing that it's true. And so, Lord, we are sheltered in the arms of God. Nothing can shake us as long as we keep our eyes fixed on you. Lord, we pray for others who, whose circumstances we got, don't know about this morning, that we haven't heard about, but you know. And Lord, we pray you give those who, who need to talk, who need to unburden their hearts, give them the courage to, to call their friends and, and to let them know that they, they need help. We all, Lord, need to just cast aside that pride that, that binds us, that imprisons us, and just know that when we open ourselves to you, to your Holy Spirit, you will respond with forgiveness and love and grace and real solid help. And now, Lord, as your family, together we say the wonderful prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and Forgive us our trespasses, as we have forgiven those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, power, and glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, there are there are some others who who, uh, who told me they were going to be here this week, and, and they're not here. So uh, pray, pray for those who are. Pray for those who are on their way. Maybe they run into some, some difficulty, but uh, know that others, their hearts are here with us this morning. And just turn, wave, say hi, and let us sing together.
have a very special story for uh, the kids today. So come on, boys, come up here to the front. And Irene will join you. And we're all going to enjoy this time together. Well, in Sunday school, we could talk about Paul, right? Okay, now Paul is a good man, and he tried to go around and all the rest of it. But you know, Paul really started out as Saul. And he wasn't a man of God. And God performed the miracle and transformed him. Now, do you know what the word transform means? What's transform? You probably know transform. What's transform? You transform it. You change it, right? It's a big change. So I thought maybe we should talk about, you know, like how the monarch butterfly transforms from an egg to a caterpillar to a bird. That's pretty boring, isn't it? Okay, okay. So you'd probably rather see something that, that is a little more noticeable than that, okay? So I brought in my special card here, okay? Now, on my special card, I have a dot. How many dots do I have here? You get one dot here, okay? And now on the other side, I've got more. On the other side, I've got, I got four dots. So how many dots did I have on the first side? One. I had one on the other side. <laughs> That changed, didn't it? Yeah. So, how many did I have on the other side? Four. Yeah, okay, I had four on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> now, that wasn't really a transformation. Okay, that's what I did. I put my hand over that one so you could see it. Okay, that's what I did. Okay, and then when I did this one, I had to put my hand over the other one so you could see it. Okay, so, see, look, it wasn't really a trick. And it was because I did it on the other side, it was really how many? There was only two on the end. <laughs> Is that two? No, three. Well, are you three yet? I don't know. But how many was on the other side? Uh, I think five. It was really five on the other side. <laughs> <wasn't it? laughs> that doesn't look like five. It's six. It's six, isn't it? But how many was on the other side? You're not sure now, are you? Three was on the other side. Okay? Three was on the other side. Okay. And so now how many was on the other side? Six. I don't know. Sunday school teacher, who is my, my darling wife, Veronica, uh, has to sing with the choir, but she can't go downstairs right now, so, so mom, could you go down there with, with the boys? And then as soon as the choir 
Yeah. You can come on, come on back up again. Hey, we, we, make, we make do. We make do. Well, under his wings, my soul shall abide, safely abide forever. It's number 412 in the Red Book. I'm going to sit down, and you can just stay, see the tune if you wish, and let's sing together. Right. 
care for against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him, I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble, I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Our reading today for the sermon comes from the book of Galatians. It's chapter 2. Chapter 2, 1 to 21. Verses 1 to 1 to 21, the whole chapter. Yeah. This is Satan, I think I hear. Galatians chapter 2. We have the word of the Lord. Fourteen years later, I went up again to Jerusalem. This time with Barnabas, I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and set before them the gospel I preached among the Gentiles. And I did this thoroughly to those who seemed to be leaders for fear that I was running or had run my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter rose because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we had in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We need not give in to them for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might remain with you. As for those who seem to be important, whatever they were, makes no difference to me. God does not judge by external appearance. Those men added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as Peter had been to the Jews. For God, who was at work in the ministry of Peter, as an apostle to the Jews, was also at work in my ministry as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Peter, and John, those reputed to be pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the Jews. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. When Peter came to Antioch, I pulled him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jew, Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was about to stand. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter, in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile, and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force the Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We, who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we, too, have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. If while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners, does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroy, I prove that I am a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, 
as if by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me, I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Thanks be to the word of God. This ends our readings for today. <coughs> I'll ask the choir now to come and sing for us. Uh, we need you, Lord. I think we can all say amen to that. Let's enjoy the choir as they minister to us today. Thank you for all your hard work. You're <laughs> <coughs> Paul's letter to 
the Galatians. And as you can see, the title of the sermon this morning is The Freedom Fighter. I wonder if you've ever thought of Paul as a freedom fighter. We're going to see that Paul was really a true freedom fighter. And to me, it's, it's sort of un unfortunate and disturbing, I guess, that nowadays the term freedom fighter can also be defined as terrorist. Uh, the, the terrorists like to call themselves freedom fighters. It, it's, it's too bad. A lot of definitions are getting messed up nowadays, aren't they? We won't go into any detail there. On, on the positive side, when you think of a freedom fighter and, and not a terrorist, you picture a, sort of a, a bare-chested guy with rippling muscles and flowing long hair, right? Remember like Arnold Schwarzenegger used to look when he was quite young. Well, anyway, something like that. There's an old, old document called The Acts of Paul and Thecla. And um, it, it's one of the writings of the New Testament Apocrypha. Apocrypha is that part of the uh, of holy uh, writ that is not divinely inspired. A long, long time ago, it was decided that that could not be included as as actual the word of God. However, uh, there are some things that are of historical interest as we read the, the Apocrypha. And um, a lot of the material in it has been passed on by word of mouth. There's an interesting description of Paul in that document, the Acts of Paul and Thecla. Uh, someone by the name of Onesiphorus sees him. He wrote this. Are you ready? Paul was a man of small stature with a bald head and crooked legs in a good state of body with eyebrows meeting and a nose somewhat hooked. Doesn't sound very attractive, does it? it not inspiring at all. But then the text goes right on to say <clears throat> the apostle also <clears throat> was full of friendliness and then it says, for now he appeared like a man, and now he had the face of an angel. I, I'd like people to say that about me. How about you? I, I could, you know, sort of skip over the, uh, the bald head, crooked legs, and hook nose part, but the rest sounds pretty good. No matter how Paul looked, <clears throat> how he looked, it didn't matter. He was a freedom fighter. And in its purest form. Because he never led any armed rebellion with weapons of war. Not at all. Never. He was armed only with the weapon of truth. Now how did he know what was true? How did he know? Well, in case you were here last week and you heard <coughs> Paul wrote in chapter 1, I want you to understand that the gospel message I preach is not based on mere human reasoning. I received my message from no human source. And no one taught me. Instead, I received it by direct revelation from Jesus Christ. Now that and it's, astound, it's an astounding statement to make. Imagine. It's hard to believe. And you wonder, well, well what's, he, what's he really talking about? Well, uh, the, the explanation is also given to us. Although you have to dig a little deeper into Galatians to, to get it. Uh, Paul met Jesus. Remember the story when he was on the road to Damascus? And after that, that wonderful incident, that conversion experience, Paul spent the next three years alone in the wilderness. In the scriptures it says Arabia, it's, it's really, scholars assure us that it was is that northern part of Arabia, not the, the Saudi Arabia we know of today. But anyway, northern Arabia. But the point is, when he was alone for those three years, he was being taught by Jesus himself, by the risen Christ himself. 
absolutely incredible. It, it sounds mysterious, obviously, and extremely hard for us to understand. But that's what Paul said. That's what he wrote. And, and you can be sure <laughs> it was just as hard for some professing Christians back then in Paul's time. It was just as hard for them to believe what Paul said. And, and obviously it's, it's hard for the majority of the world today as well. But you know, for us, it, it shouldn't be hard to trust the Apostle Paul, should it? Because he wrote half the New Testament, good grief. Half the New Testament was written by Paul. So we have to believe that what Paul wrote was the truth. History remembers Paul as one of the two greatest original followers of Jesus. The other leader, of course, would have been Peter himself. But in my opinion, Paul surpasses Peter, absolutely. Uh, one of my reasons for believing that is that without Paul, Christianity might possibly and probably would have remained only a sect of Judaism. Instead of the religion that quite literally has changed the world forever. And I say change the world forever, well, many reasons, but think of this. Why does the whole world, whether or not they believe in Jesus, why does the whole world uh, say and believe that this is the year 2023? Even non-religious people, even, even atheists who don't believe in God, everyone agrees, the whole world around, that this year is 2023. Now, according to the Jews, this is the year 5784. Did you know that? According to the Jews, to Orthodox Jews, this is the year 5784, not 2023. Well, let's take the country of China, probably along with India, but let's take China, the most populous country in the world. According to China, this is the year 4720. It is. It's the year 4720. But, but whatever some individual countries may say, every one of them without exception, they use the Christian calendar. They don't. They do, don't they? They all, the whole world uses the Christian calendar. It's 2023. Now Paul said he started preaching the gospel message before he met anybody, before he met any of the other leaders, before he met uh, Peter or James or John or, or, or any of the other first disciples of Jesus, he got his message not from them. He got it straight from Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John had not even written. He had no Gospels to refer to. And he didn't talk to any of the followers of Jesus. He got it from Jesus himself. I don't know if you realize that or not. Paul was an amazing, incredible man. He was truly unique among men. But Paul's fellow apostles didn't believe that back then. They didn't believe it at first. And that led to a fight. Not an armed battle, but a battle of principles, a battle for truth. Did you think that dispute amongst, Christian, amongst Christians is, is something new in our lifetime? Absolutely not. There has always been controversy. Always been contention. There has always been, been downright fighting. Why do you think there were a, a thousand different denominations in the world today? Duh. <laughs> it's always been the case. And we see it way back at the very beginning in the letter to the Galatians. By the way, the letter to the Galatians is the first letter that Paul ever wrote. A battle of principles, a battle for truth. Now to Paul, his spiritual liberty in Christ 
was worth more, far more, than popularity, as were far more than even personal security. He was willing to fight for that liberty and to leave God to take care of his personal security. The man was, was fearless. Now, his first fight for Christian liberty was at the Jerusalem Council. You can read about that in Acts chapter 15 if you want to. His second fight was, a, was a, a private meeting with Peter. Now, both those incidents are referred to in our text this morning in Galatians chapter 2. I don't know about you. Personally, I hate confrontation. And, you know, just like I hate traffic jams. I, I'd rather drive a half hour out of my way to get around traffic. What about you? I hate confrontation. I, I would rather, I'd rather just walk away and bite my tongue than have to argue with anybody, especially publicly. But sometimes it just simply cannot be avoided. And Paul obviously felt that this was one of the times it could not be avoided. And had he not faced it, had he not faced it at this point in history, the solemn truth is that the message of Jesus might never have reached us. It would have been lost in a sea of Jewish legalism and there would be no Christians today. That is how critical it was that Paul stood up and faced the truth back then. Thank God for Paul. He's, he's a hero. He, he faced it head on. It couldn't have been easy. For, for just look at what he faced in, in that, that, that first fight, the, the Council of, of Jerusalem. There were two sides. On one side, there was Paul and his preaching colleague at the time, Barnabas, and, and Titus, who was a Gentile convert of Paul's. And he was the, the man to whom Paul wrote the letter to Titus in, in the New Testament. On the other side, <laughs> imagine, picture this, on the other side you have the, the three giants of the faith. You have the Apostle Peter. You have the Apostle John. And you have James, the half-brother of Jesus. That's formidable, formidable opposition. Paul, and who's, who's a nobody, and two other nobodies against the three most prominent Christians of the time. And yet there stood Paul. Paul against the pillars of the church. Imagine what it must have been like. What was the issue? What was the big deal? In a way, we, we, we wonder why was it so important, but it was incredibly important. It was the issue of circumcision. Now, you all know that it's okay for a baby boy, for an infant, to be circumcised. That's pretty routine. But imagine how devastating it would be for an adult man to be told he had to be circumcised. I can't even think of how painful that would be. But think of how, how Titus, poor Titus, he was a Gentile, uncircumcised. Imagine how terrified he must have been standing up there knowing the issue was surgery. <laughs> Radical surgery on him. So the question was, is anyone fully saved if they have not been circumcised? Now ladies, this has nothing to do with you. Sadly, Sadly, there are certain cultures in our world today who practice female circumcision, believe it or not. It's dreadful. It's barbaric. It's the most obscene and horrible thing imaginable. Well, the Jews didn't do that. The truth is, with ladies, you were just sort of not considered as part of the equation back then. Things have changed now, yes, for the good. But back then, the issue was, was with the men. Circumcision, yes or no? Now today, 
other questions might be asked. Like, for instance, someone might say, is a person saved if they've not been baptized? Well, that's a huge issue for, for, for many today. In fact, there's a, there's a, a prominent church, I won't mention the name, who have always taught that, that uh, unless a baby, an infant, is baptized, they don't go to heaven. Can you believe that? Well, it's true. It's true. It's horrible. I, I was thinking of it this way. How about that thief on the cross? Did he go to heaven? Well, he wasn't baptized. How could he go to heaven? Well, here's the reason why. Because Jesus said so, that's why. <laughs> Jesus said, I'm telling you the truth. Today, you're going to be with me in paradise. How does it work? What's, what's the, the answer to all of these issues? Here it is. And it's given to us way back in, in 1 Samuel chapter 16. And it answers all of these questions and it's this. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. And nobody can see your heart except God himself. So let's let God do the judgment. And the final result of all this was that they arrived at, I guess you could call a godly compromise. Paul and Barnabas would go to the Gentiles with the gospel, and Peter, John, and James would go to the Jews. And the, one, the only thing they would have in common is they would continue to help those, to the poor. They would continue to help those in financial need. The goal was that the Gentile believers would not be either stumbled by Jewish Christians, nor become stumbling blocks to the salvation of, up to that point, unbelieving Jews. It worked. It was the solution. It was simple. And it was elegant. <laughs> but it wasn't the end. <laughs> Sadly, there was another battle to fight. The first battle had been won, but apparently the war was still on. And this is why Paul is so important. Here's what happened. After the agreement was made, Peter changed his mind. What? Prominent religious leader changed his mind? Really? How about Peter? Can't get more prominent than that. Peter changed his mind. And by the way, he also influenced James. And he influenced Paul's own dear closest friend at the time, Barnabas. So, so Paul had to do the most painful thing any pastor sometimes has to do. And that was to publicly call out Peter for his hypocrisy. What was Peter's hypocrisy? When he was, 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 with, was with Jews, he went along with Jewish customs. And when he was sitting down to eat with Gentiles, he forgot about the Jewish customs and went along with them. And there's no other word for that but hypocrisy. That's what Paul said himself. Imagine, you stand up face to face with a man like Peter, and you say, Peter, you're a hypocrite. What? I'd be very, wouldn't you be very careful? about doing something like that? Paul had to do that. Peter, he probably said, Peter, I love you, but <laughs> you're a hypocrite. What it all boils down to is this. How can a person be justified before God? It, it was a, an issue back then. It's an issue all through, the, all through the New Testament, and it is still an issue today. And many prominent churches today are saying, oh yeah, it's true. Jesus died for the, for the sins of the world. However, however, you have to keep on working or you'll never get to heaven. You have to keep on proving yourself or you won't get to heaven. 
The answer, the truth is, the just shall live by faith. How was Abraham saved? Is Abraham in heaven? Would you say Abraham's in heaven? Abraham's in heaven. How did Abraham get there? He lived 2,000, 2,000 years before Jesus ever came to earth. How did Abraham get to heaven? He got there by faith. Abraham looked forward to the Messiah who would one day be born. And he lived by faith. Not seeing it with his eyes. But believing what's going to happen. He believed God, it says in the scriptures. Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. That's how he got saved. And we are told, Paul says, we are saved the same way. We are justified by faith. By faith. The only difference is Abraham looked forward to it. We look back to it. But the central point of history, the hinge upon which all history turns, is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. God wonderfully, mercifully declares believing sinners to be righteous. The wonder is called amazing grace. Sinners thereby saved by this marvelous grace. The grace of God. In God's eyes we become righteous. How then? In, in, in how are we to be righteous? We're declared righteous. The penalty for sin has been paid and we're on our way to heaven. But we have to live righteously. No hypocrisy allowed. Nowadays, you hear some prominent preachers say that they had a, a personal encounter with Jesus. You hear it all the time. I don't believe them. It takes some courage to say that, by the way. It doesn't make you very popular. I don't believe these men. I don't believe them at all. But I do believe Paul. Paul, as I said last week, Paul oozes credibility. Paul, I believe. Because you can just see how much Jesus meant to him. Jesus changed his life. Changed him completely and forever. There was not even a, 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 a whiff of hypocrisy in Paul. He was all in for Jesus. When Paul met the risen Christ that day on the road to Damascus, remember, he had been on his way to supervise the torture and the imprisonment and the execution of totally innocent Christians. Their only crime was turning their backs on a dead religion. Paul, back then, just could not see that they had now truly embraced a living God. God was no longer a thing to them. God was no longer an idea. God was now a living God. And they embraced that. And they, they had proved what they had done by throwing away their useless pride. Pride in thinking that they, that they could ever become good enough on their own to merit going to heaven. And they were told, well, you get there by not just following the Ten Commandments, which are impossible for anyone to follow, but they had to follow not only the Ten Commandments, but over 600, get it, over 600 rules and regulations that have been laid down by, the, by the, the Pharisees down through the centuries. Rules and regulations imposed on them by that dead religion. But at that moment, at that moment, Jesus met Paul. And Paul met Jesus. <laughs> Jesus knocked him to the ground, temporarily blinded his eyes, because only then could Paul truly, truly see. At that very moment, Paul knew. And now he wrote to the churches of Galatia some immortal words, fantastic words. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. 
and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Wow. Some years ago, a song was written. It was called Crucified with Christ. And here's, here's, here are the words. As I look back on what I thought was living, I'm amazed at the price I chose to pay and to think I ignored what really mattered because I thought the sacrifice would be too great. But when I finally reached the point of giving in, I found the cross was calling even then. And even though it took dying to survive, I never felt so much alive. For I am crucified with Christ, and yet I live. Not I, but Christ that lives within me. His cross will never ask for more than I can give. For it's not my strength, but His. There is no greater sacrifice. For I am crucified with Christ. And yet I live. Paul considered the old, the old Paul to be dead. And a brand new Paul to be alive. I can't think of a better definition of being born again. The old has gone. The new has come. And nothing could ever be the same again. I, I think the words of that song captures very well what Paul meant. This fearless freedom fighter was telling us as followers of Jesus that freedom can only come when we let go of our selfishness and our pride and start to live by faith and to trust the Holy Spirit who graciously loves us enough to live in us and to put up with us until Jesus comes. Amen. God bless you as you give to the work of the Lord.
Red Book again, number 260, and can it be that I should gain? Let's sing it together. <laughs>